A few years ago, before we founded Cronova Engineering, we set out to design the ultimate mechanical espresso machine. Over the years we have received many requests to make it into something that people could buy. So that's what we did. We are launching this project on Kickstarter, so anyone who is interested can purchase this machine. Links in the description. In this video I will discuss the design of the machine, how it operates and our solution for measuring the water pressure without a pressure gauge. I will aim to make everything about this as transparent as possible, so if there is something you don't understand by the end of the video, just leave a comment and we will do our best to answer it. There are two versions of this machine. The one you see here is called the Epoch Fulcrum, which uses a lever to generate pressure in the brew chamber. Later on in the video we will show you the other system. Hot water is poured into the brew chamber straight from a kettle. Here we use a fellow stag pouring kettle, traditionally designed for filter coffee, but the espresso machine works great with any kettle. We've designed this machine to last for generations by simplifying the system down to the bare requirements needed to make delicious espresso. We also avoided using any electrical component such as a heating element or pump to maximise its reliability. The lever is just one of two ways we use to generate pressure in the brew chamber. We designed another system named the Epoch Helix which uses a screw thread instead. We have worked on optimising the pitch of the thread so that espresso can be made with minimal faff and without requiring much force to reach the required pressure. As you will see later when I assemble the two machines, many of the components are the same for both. This allows us to make the machines modular. With little effort the fulcrum can be converted to the helix and vice versa. Screw threads are an amazing way of increasing force, and although there is a slight loss of efficiency, the force required on the handle of the helix is significantly less than the fulcrum. Of course, the rules of physics do unfortunately apply, so there must be a compromise for this reduction in force. The handle has to move further for a screw base system than a lever system. We ensured the handle would self-lock, allowing easy drainage and a nice dry coffee puck at the end. Assuming your coffee is already ground or you have access to a hand grinder, both machines are capable of operation without electricity. Speaking of grinding, since these machines are designed to make the best espresso possible, they don't use a pressurised basket, which means they do need to be paired with a grinder to be used properly. Here Alistair shows how the independence from electricity allows these machines to be used for camping, caravans or narrowboats where an electric kettle is not always possible. The Helix is especially good for this due to its small size. One of the common criticisms of other manual machines is the inability to achieve high enough temperatures. To alleviate this issue we calculated the required thickness and material properties of a cylinder liner to insulate the water and keep it as hot as possible. In this experiment the readout on the left is the temperature inside the cylinder and the readout on the right shows the temperature of the water in the cup. Two cylinder preheats is optimal, which results in a brew temperature of 95 degrees centigrade. After brewing the coffee in the cup is around 70 degrees centigrade on this granite base. A wooden base results in a hotter final coffee of around 80 degrees centigrade. Note that during the brew process the temperature in the cylinder appears to drop. This is because all the water has transferred underneath the piston, so the thermocouple is no longer submerged. So that's temperature, what about pressure? We filed a patent for this idea, which makes use of the flex in the handles for each of the machines to read out a calibrated pressure. We have developed versions for both the fulcrum and the helix. As far as the user is concerned, the handles have imperceptible flex, but we've designed the system to accentuate this small amount of flex in each case. The helix is currently set such that when the ring aligns with the centre of the lead screw, 10 bar pressure is achieved. The calibration of the pressure gauge can be changed to read any desired value. For those interested in this, we will be making the calibration graphs freely available. On the fulcrum machine the pressure can be read off the scale and the mechanism is neatly tucked away inside the hollow handle. The key benefit of this system is that no access ports need to be made in the cylinder for a conventional pressure gauge, 
which may result in leaks and stagnant water inside the gauge. A conventional pressure gauge also tends to be bulky and gets in the way. Let's have a look at how we made the prototype pressure gauge for the Helix machine, starting with the handle. The version you saw earlier in the video was CNC machined, but manual machining is a really good prototyping technique. This method allows us to try lots of design options without investing in expensive CNC machining. Therefore, the pre-production prototype you saw earlier is actually the result of several earlier prototypes. Once the rectangular block has been shaped for the handle, the holes are machined and the fixing points are tapped into the rectangular block. The rectangular shape allows us to accurately reference the position of the holes. We then work on machining the shape of the handle on the milling machine, using the rotary table to form the ends. For the pressure gauge mechanism to work, we have designed flexibility into the handle by thinning a region near the centre of rotation. This is thin enough to allow a small amount of flex that can be mechanically magnified with a simple mechanism, but not so thin as to cause noticeable flexibility in the handle when in use. Here, Alistair is machining the gearing mechanism to magnify that small amount of flexibility. He mounts a brass strip in the lathe on a special fixture to form an arc on the end before mounting it in a dividing head on the milling machine to form the gear teeth. A pin in slot mechanism could also be used to the same effect and this is also covered by the patent. A smaller gear is meshed with that larger gear sector. Alistair makes the smaller gear from brass. And here's the assembled mechanism. The wooden handle is attached and this handle subassembly is fitted to the machine. Let's have a look at what makes up the rest of the machine. This time, let's start with the fulcrum. To assemble the machine, the cylinder liner is inserted into the cylinder bore and held in place with two grub screws that locate with a groove in the liner. The cylinder is then attached to the main pillar with three bolts. This sub-assembly can be bolted to the base. Here we show a granite base but there are many other options available. Thanks to the modular design, anybody can make bases or handles to their preferred design. For those who are interested in this, we're offering an option for people to buy a self-assemble kit, where you can also make your own handles and bases. We will show you how later in the video. This next block is to stop the handle on the fulcrum machine from moving downwards too far, and the fork on the top forms the lever pivot point. As you saw at the start, one of the design features we felt was necessary was allowing water to be poured into the cylinder without needing to take the piston out. Of course, the coffee bed sits below the piston, so we needed a way to allow water to be transferred from above the piston to beneath it where it can make contact with the coffee. We designed a non-return valve in the piston to allow this. We wanted to keep the system as simple as possible whilst allowing the same piston to be used for the fulcrum as for the helix to maximise modularity. The non-return valve is based on allowing a small amount of play so that when the handle is lifted a gap between the hemispherical component and the piston opens allowing water to rush through. When the handle is released the gap closes and a seal is formed. We have experimented with many different designs and this method works amazingly well whilst keeping the design as simple as possible. At the other end of the conrod we made use of a special bushing to maximise longevity and reduce friction. Here I slide the piston into the cylinder before fitting the shower screen and group seal. The shower screen helps disperse water evenly across the bed of coffee which is really important to achieve an even extraction and consequently a tasty espresso. Next, I assemble the portafilter by screwing on the handle. 
Again, the handle is fitted onto a standard piece of studding, making it easy to make alternative handles and swap them according to preference. The basket is held into the porter filter body with a small spring. The baskets are easy to switch with other 51mm baskets from La Pavoni or IMS and single or double baskets. The industry standard uses 58mm baskets, but we decided against this for a few reasons. Firstly, pressure is equal to force divided by area, so therefore the smaller the cylinder diameter, the less force required to get to pressure. But a small cylinder diameter relative to the coffee diameter means the distribution of water will be more focused in the centre of the coffee puck, leading to a less even extraction. Secondly, in our opinion, the slightly smaller dose of coffee we use 15 grams, is actually more enjoyable than the larger typical 18 gram dose, but it is still possible to fit deeper baskets if the larger dose is preferable. Thirdly, this is still a standard size, so there are plenty of third party options for spares out there. Here's a good example of a design feature that only came about from years of use. Having tried threaded pins to hold the lever in place, and found they had a tendency to come undone with use, we opted to use circlips for this application. Of course, we could have just applied a bit of threadlock compound, and in fact most manufacturers do this, but the threadlocker becomes less effective once the pin is removed for tinkering or servicing. The handle is now slotted on. Again, we designed this to be as moddable as possible. The helix is very similar in many respects, so I will run through this quickly. The pillar is shorter on the helix, and for variety we decided to use a walnut base rather than a granite one. Rather than a con rod, here we use a lead screw. We designed a mechanism to fit onto the bottom of the lead screw, which allows us to fit the hemispherical component from the side, thus negating the need for an o-ring which we wanted to avoid here as the lead screw must rotate relative to the hemispherical component. The leaf spring allows a tiny amount of movement which is necessary due to the higher thermal expansion coefficient of the aluminium cylinder relative to the stainless steel lead screw. Without this spring the cylinder effectively stretches slightly which results in a slight leak during the warm up phase when making a cup of coffee. So that's the machines assembled, I mentioned earlier that I would show how you might go about making some of the parts, such as the base or handles for those interested in customising it themselves. Starting with the portafilter handle, in this case it comes out of a plank of walnut, but this would be a great opportunity to use that recycled piece of old tree sitting in the corner of the shed, or perhaps use another method entirely, such as 3D printing or resin casting. Here, two pieces are glued together to make a blank thick enough for the handle. Once the glue has dried, Alistair marks the centre and then scribes a rough circle guide for him to plane down to, before mounting it in the lathe to turn circular, then drill and tap for the M12 studding. A lathe is not required here. A hand carved handle is also a valid approach, it all just depends on the tools you have available. The handle is now shaped, here we make it with a simple taper and a rounded end and we think this feels comfortable. The same approach is used for the other wooden handles. Here we machine the smaller handle for the Helix Espresso machine. We make it slightly mushroom shaped with a file. The handle is parted off and mounted on a stub allowing a recess to be machined in the end with an end mill. There are, of course, other ways of making this recess, such as with a forstner bit.
We finish the handles with varnish. Alistair now makes the base of the Helix Espresso machine. Here at Cronova we're a fan of hand tools. Yes, they are slower than machine tools, but much more peaceful and enjoyable to use than the equivalent power tools. We also like to think it's a bit more in keeping with the manual espresso machine. In the same way a guitar top is made, in this case we chose to book match the wood to provide a nice symmetrical grain pattern. The holes to bolt down the main pillar are marked out and drilled. Here we chose to round the corners of the base. This is marked out and a coping saw is used to curve the corners. A bevel is applied and the base is finished with varnish to match the handles. We chose not to add a drip tray. After some time trying one we found it much easier to just catch the preheat water in a cup. If you are interested in this machine, please check out our Kickstarter. Otherwise, we hope you enjoyed a look into our design process. Thanks for watching.